Uh, on Sundays, I'm going to be preaching, on Sunday nights, I'm going to be preaching a series of messages out of the Minor Prophets. Um, you know, when we went through the book of Acts, we preached one message uh, out of each chapter. It's 28 chapters, 28 messages. <clears throat> Not saying that that one message covered that entire chapter. We just took a truth and, and, and brought a message out of that truth. So, in this series, uh, from Hosea through the end of the uh, Old Testament, Malachi, we'll be preaching one message out of each, uh, each book. I'll be telling you a little bit about the book. It's not going to be like a Wednesday night necessarily, but we'll talk a little about the book so that to give you, excuse me, a little bit of background information. And then, uh, and then, the, and then most likely the main theme, you know, in that book. So, uh, and kind of excited about that. There's not a lot of preaching out of the Minor Prophets. Um, I've preached several sermons here out of the Minor Prophets, but uh, often in, in, people's, in people's Bible reading, they never get that far. It's like, I'm going to read my Bible through this year. I'm going to read every, you know, but, but about by February 15th, you know, they've done lost control of that. And, and you know what I'm saying. We've all been there. But, um, and so, you know, rarely do people get up through the Minor Prophets in the Old Testament. And there are wonderful books, wonderful books, and a lot of great truth in it. So I decided to, uh, to preach a series of sermons. So it'll, be, it'll call, be called the Minor Prophets series, all right? And today, tonight, we'll begin with, <clears throat> with the book of Hosea. And a very, very interesting book here. And it's amazing sometimes what God required of His Old Testament prophets. And be glad you weren't one. Uh, and this one here has an unbelievable uh, uh, setting, set of circumstances that God told Hosea, told him to do something there. And some of you are, you, you know, are probably familiar with it, but nevertheless, we're going to look at it tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. And, and, uh, and that's exactly what we see here in this book. You were so good to your nation, yet they did turn and they did backslide. And we're going to take a look at that tonight, Father. So help us to learn from their backslidden ways and help us not to repeat, repeat the, the same and follow in the same steps of Israel's backsliding. Holy Spirit, have your will and way in our service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Look at Hosea 2, chapter 2, and look at verse 5. Verse 5, we're going to read like four verses here. All right, uh, Hosea chapter 2, verse 5. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For, she said, I will go after my lovers that gave me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, God says to them, and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. God says, I'm going to have a problem with that, and, and my judgment is going to come. And she shall follow after her lovers. Now get that, it's a strange, that's a strange statement there. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then... Shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now? For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Do you get that? God says, I prepared I prepared for you. I blessed you. I prospered you with the very things that you prepared to offer to Baal. What God's doing here in this book, Hosea is a prophet to Israel, to the northern kingdom. After David, after Solomon, the, 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 the kingdom split. Remember, we've, taught, we've talked about this over and over. Ten tribes called the Northern Kingdom, all right, uh, split from two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, uh, called the Southern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom was referred to as Israel. The Southern Kingdom was referred to as 
Judah. Right, Judah. And so Hosea was a prophet to the ten tribes in the north, the northern kingdom, Israel. His ministry began about 750 B.C. And he preached through 722 B.C., which is about 18 years. Now think about it. This is a man of God that preached for 18 years to ten tribes in the north that did not repent. Did not repent. And he preached that judgment's coming. Judgment for 18 years. Can you imagine? Judgment's coming and they would not repent. And this is the book and God gives us a highlight here of His, of His ministry. Hosea witnessed the destruction of Israel about which he prophesied. Do you remember what nation it was that God used? What heathen nation it was that God used to wipe out the ten tribes in the north? Assyria. That's right, Assyria. About a hundred years later, Judah, the two tribes in the south, after watching what happened to the ten tribes in the north, and God gave them prophets too and said, just like what I did here, I'm going to do to you if you don't turn, your, turn from your ways. And they didn't. And they were also wiped out by ba the Babylonians. But we're talking about, we're talking about Hosea and the, 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 the Israel, ten tribes in the north there. Now here's what God asked Hosea, told Hosea to do. I want you to go out and I want you to marry a prostitute. He said, because I am going to use you I'm going to use you as a living, breathing example of what, your, of what my people are doing to me. I, but that's not all. Now look, that's what, if it ended there, that would be righteous. Because God is righteous. Amen? He is righteous. He is holy. He never does wrong. It's not because He chooses not to, but because He cannot do wrong. He can't. He can't lie. He can't do wrong. He can't sin. It's not in him. And if he stopped there, he would be, that would be his right to do so. But he doesn't. He says, I'm going to use your life as a living, breathing example of what my people are doing to me in their lack of faithfulness and turning away to other gods in spiritual adultery. But, he says, but I'm also going to, uh, 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 your ministry will be telling my nation, this is what you've done to me, but this is what I want to do for you. And, and, and this plays out uh, through our sermon tonight. And I'm, it's, 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 a, it's a great truth. God is merciful and gracious and forgiving. There's not a person in this room that would ever tolerate a people that did what Israel did to God. But he says, I'm going to illustrate what you're doing to me and it's spiritual adultery. But I'm also going to illustrate what I desire to do for you, not to you, for you. The people had, had, had come to include in their worship other gods. It doesn't mean, now listen, it doesn't mean that they walked away from God. And, and, I, may, and I may say that, I may use that phrase tonight just, just by habit, but it doesn't mean that they walked away. What they did was they said, we are going to worship you because the book of Hosea talks about them offering, their offerings and their sacrifices. Right? And so uh, what God says is, I understand you haven't, you haven't really turned from me, but what you've done is you've drug all these other gods into your worship of me. And how often do we as believers do that? We say, no, 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 I believe in you. And my salvation is rooted in, in the truth and in, in your son and the work that he did. And, and, and uh, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. But I'm also going to bring other gods in to, to my worship. I'm going to cover all the bases. And this is where they went wrong. It's not that they said, forget you. They said, no, 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 we, we remember you, but we're also going to bring all these other gods in too. And we're going to worship them also. 
They worship one of the main gods that they brought into their worship of the Lord was Baal. Baal. He was considered a fertility god. A fertility god. They felt, and the teaching was, that he was thought to be the source of fertility in the field and in the flock and in the family. So they want to cover their bases. Never mind, look, never mind the history that they have of God taking care of them, of God bringing them out of Egypt. They said no because of the influence of the surrounding nations, because of the desire to make peace with them. We're going to take on some of their religion because of intermarrying with them. uh, uh, We'll be bringing in other religion and we're going to mix it in. And we're not going to forget you. We're still going to offer the same sacrifices and we're still going to follow the same worship that we should do. But we're also going to bring other gods in. And that doesn't work. It does not work. Do you remember the story where the, I think it was the Philistines, and now I'm just pulling this out of the back of my mind, so if I get a couple details wrong, just go with me on it. I think it was the Philistines that captured the ark, and they put the ark in with their god called Dagon. They put it in a room with Dagon. And what was it? The first, the, the, after the first night, they came in the next day, and Dagon, the, the statue of Dagon had toppled over. And they said, huh, that's strange. I wonder how that happened. Well, somebody must have been in here messing around. I don't, look, I don't know what they said. I'm just creating conversation. But they, So they left. They set Dagon back up, and they left the ark in there. They came back the next night, and Dagon's, I think it was, his hands were cut off and his head was cut off. And he laid on the ground. You don't mix. God says, I will not be mixed with other gods. Doesn't matter that doesn't matter that you, you, you give me some attention, but when you bring others, look, when you bring other gods in, little G gods, and we all know that they're not gods. Right? There, there are no other gods. And God says, when you when you bring in your imaginative, these people, these, the, these, the, the, these, these representatives that you have created in your own mind and with your own hands, wooden and made of gold and silver and different things, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, that's not the way, it's not the way this is supposed to work. So, but this is what they did. Now, through his marriage to Gomer, Gomer was the prostitute. God says, you're going to marry a prostitute. And, and then I'm going to teach the nation. I'm going, to, I'm going to use you as a living, breathing example. They had three children. Some people say that, that these three children might have not have, have even been, excuse me, Hosea's. I'm not sure I'm buying that. Um, I'm, I don't think that's clear. So I'm just going to go with the, 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 uh, the stated, excuse me, Scripture. They had three children. Now, at this time, you can see... You can see the, uh, the state of Israel in their three children. And understand, God's behind all of this. God's working all of this. All right? Number one, the Bible teaches that Israel was born, the nation of Israel was born after what great event? Anybody? I, look, when I tell you, you're going to go, oh yeah, sure, of course. When He brought them out of Egypt. When they went into Egypt, they were one family, Right? They were one family. And, but, then, but then they became very prosperous and, and, and grew in numbers while they were uh, in the, under the service of the Egyptians. And when he brought them out, they were two and a half million or so strong. And that's when he says, this is my nation now. He had foretold of it, but when he brings them out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and out of Mount Horeb, that, that was the birth of the nation Israel. The first child that Gomer and and Hosea have is named Jezreel. Jezreel. It means, the the word Jezreel means scattered, indicating that the time that God was going to scatter His people. When the Assyrians did come down in 722 B.C. and wiped them out, they were scattered throughout the Assyrian nation. So God says, I'm going to scatter you. Child number two, Laruama. Laruama means unpitied, referring to God lifting His mercy off of His people and allowing them to suffer for their sins. 
God says, I'm going to scatter you and you will be unpitied. I'm going to. Can you look? We have no clue that if God were to remove his hand from our lives today, what wreckage would happen tomorrow? God, look, we think we got this. Our pride tells us that we got this. And God says, You have nothing. If my mercy is not on, your, not on you every day, your lives would be wrecked. And that's the truth. And God says, even though you're backsliding, and even though for decades you've been, you, 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 you've been not totally turning from me, but bringing other gods and mixing your religion, He says, I'm getting ready to pull my hand off. And when I pull my hand off, it all goes south. The third child, his name is Loami. Loami. And that means not my people. Whew. Not my people. Indicating that at this present time in God's program, when Israel is out of fellowship with God and His people are not His people as they at one time were. You know, God said to them, you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. But God says, no, there's going to be a time and I'm taking my hand off. You're going to suffer for your sins. You're going to be judged for your sins. I'm going to remove my hand of mercy. Everything's going to fall apart. And I will not be your God for that time. And you will not be my people. That's illustrated through the birth of these three children. Now, not only is God uh, telling them what they are. Uh, I just made that statement. Not, not only are they telling them what you're doing to me, but, but I also want to tell you in the book of Hosea what I desire to do for you. To invite them back and to forgive their sins and to be reconciled. God says, you, you know, there is going to be a time, I'm just going to, I'm going to step back. I'm going to, I'm going to step back. It's what we, it's, it's, it's similar to what we talk about when, when we talk about that the Holy Spirit's work in a church. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, what does He do? Fine. You don't want to listen to me. You don't want to follow me. You, you won't be corrected. Then I'm going to step back. You know why? Because I'm grieved. I'm grieved. And that's what God says. More or less, He says, I'm grieved at how you're treating me. I'm giving, I'm prospering you, and you're turning around and offering it to Baal. What God desires is, the, you know, justice, judgment. But He also loves us so much that He wants to be reconciled. Now, to be very well, I've already mentioned that. Hosea's message is this. You're backslidden and judgment is coming, but it doesn't have to be this way. It's your choice. God's, God gave him a preacher, and he says, judgment's coming. And God's going to take his hand off. You're going to be scattered. And God will not be your people. I'm sorry, God will not be your God for a time. He's going to scatter you throughout the nation. But it doesn't have to be this way. This is where I see a lot of God's children today. I mean, look, and not just me, you see it also. It's not that they've left off and walked away, though. Some have. In this day and time. There'll come a time, uh, the New Testament tells us, Paul tells us, when people will not endure sound doctrine. And there are, peop there are people that are walking away. I just, I just, hey, in this day and time, yeah, I don't know that I'm buying that anymore. I don't know, you know, th this just seems so right. And everything in our society is pushing us this way. But I'm talking to even Christians that haven't left God, really. They go, still go to church. They still do the things that maybe they should do. But they've also ushered in a bunch of other idols, a bunch of other gods into their lives. Which keep them from serving God. Which, which keeps them from being faithful. And makes them spiritual adulterers. In giving, we say, well, if I have the money, I'll give. That's kind of the way that they were treating God. Only they're, they were like, look, they're doing like what we do sometimes. 
I have the money to pay the tithe, but I choose to spend it over here. In serving. In serving. I have time. I have energy. I have everything needed to serve God. And I'll give it some thought. But I kind of I really want to use my resources, my, ser my time, my allotment of time, my free time. I kind of want it to go over here. Knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6 says, For my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It's like, no, there's a way which seemeth right. I don't think I'll just follow this. I don't think I'm going to submit myself to the Word of God. I don't think that I'm going to study it to try to learn it, incorporate it into my life. No, I'm doing okay with my other little G gods. And we don't desire. We are to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's New Testament. We are to grow in the knowledge. We are to always to be uh, uh, um, uh, attaining knowledge. Obedience. Well, as long as it doesn't interfere with my life. I'll be glad to obey as long as it doesn't interfere with my life. The fun things I like to do, the, th the things that I like to possess, the relationships. Now, I can't really go there. If I go there, it's going to wreck this relationship I have. Then that relationship has just become a God, become an idol. Now, we're going to look quickly here at, um, I got two points here, I think, tonight. Let's see. I believe that's true, and that is true. Number one, Israel served other gods which the Lord called lovers. Lovers. I mean, he really gets down. The rubber is really meeting the road here. And he says, Hosea married a prostitute. And Hosea is representing me, and the prostitute is representing you. And she cheat, and she, was, she cheated on uh, Hosea. She was unfaithful. She left. She actually left Hosea to go after other lovers. Now the other lovers here, uh, the main reference here could be toward Egypt and Assyria, two nations that Israel had spiritual affairs with because of her reliance upon them. She stopped relying, the nation of Israel stopped relying upon God. And they found their, they found their strength, they found their prosperity, they found everything that they needed in Egypt and in these heathen wicked nations. And God's like, well, I mean, how do you forget this? Look, they forgot it just how we forget it. They forgot the great things that God had done for them. Verse 5 writes about that we already read, that she enjoyed, mistakenly uh, attributed these wicked nations and their God, the things that she enjoyed. And let me back up here and I'll read it for you again. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore behold, well then it tells what God's going to do. In verse 8, For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they prepared for Baal. God is correcting them in verse 8 and saying, No, I gave to you. James 1.17, Every good gift and every perfect uh, gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. God says, no, 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 I've prospered you. And the minute I take my hand off of you, it's all going south. My, my hand of mercy. But Israel is wooed by the faithless, unknowable spirit in themselves that continues in the ways of the world in spite of God's blessings. We look, look, we often use, we often use, look, we're away from God at times, and then we look at everything we got and say, well, God must be okay with this. Look at what I got. Look at what I have. And so God must be okay with my wicked lifestyle. No. No, He's not. And, you, but, and, and you're attributing your prosperity. We attribute our pr prosperity so, sometimes to our power. And God says, you couldn't do anything if I took my hand off of you. They are wooed, though, by that, that, that nature that we have. We can be wooed to follow the things of the world. 
Believers today have affairs with other gods of this world, giving them the credit for the prosperity they experience, which was, which was given to them by God. And look, in a lot of ways, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir tonight. You, you know, I may say you or we or us. I understand that in, in a lot of ways I'm preaching to the choir tonight. But this is, a, this is a message out of Hosea. It's the main theme of Hosea. And it's a warning that I want us to be very clear on. Because the same thing that happened to Israel can happen to us. The same, thing that, the same thing that happened to Israel is happening in our nation today. Same thing. God says, I've given you everything. And you were. Look, and our nation was founded upon Christian principles. Yes, it was. All you got to do is follow the data. <laughs> Just do some research. Do some research to see what the founding fathers had to say about God and the founding of this nation. It's very clear. Don't let them rewrite history. We often think, well, the latest person doing the writing is probably more educated than those people were, you know, 100 years ago. And we're getting the latest. We've we got the great advantage of, of having people that are smarter than they were 100 years ago. Mm, I don't think so. I think they're dumber. Let me ask you this. If you have a spring in your backyard, do you want to get your water? Do you want to get the cleanest, clearest water? Will you get it where it first comes out of that ground? Or might you find it 150 yards down the way after it's traveled and been contaminated by things in the world? You're going to get it right there. <clears throat> Don't let people say, and look, I've heard this this past week. Someone might make the statement to me that, well, but the newer, the newer writings... The, the, the newer theologians who are much more educated than the Spurgeons and the Matthew Henrys, and I say baloney in the name of Jesus. <laughs> They're not. Anyhow, now get your doctrine from, from, from the closest you can to the source. There was a preacher one time, not here, years ago somewhere, had an affair in a church. <clears throat> and after he was found out, his, his reasoning that he offered to, to the deacons or to some other pastor that was trying to help him was that I felt more spiritual and more powerful when I was having this affair. I felt more spiritual and more powerful in the pulpit. Look, look. That for me is where electricians is where the breaker just snaps off. It's like there's a dead short. There's an explosion of thought there for me. It makes no sense. But yet he felt that way. And that's how we convince ourselves too. Sometimes we're just as dumb as he was. And, and, we, and we read sources, and we get influenced by this, and we listen to this, and get influenced by that. And next thing you know, our doctrine's changing. Next thing you know, we're inviting other small gods into the, into the holy of holies of our heart. And we are becoming spiritual adulterers. God help us to fight against the wooing of the world. And remain faithful to the one, capital O, the one that saved us and keeps us and with whom we will spend eternity. Second point, the actions of her affair are listed in several places. And I'm just going to go through these quickly here. Israel's action in leaving God or, or, or bringing other gods and mixing their religion. That God, God birthed her when he brought them out of Egypt, cared for her. But he lays them out here. They counseled with wooden idols. Do you want a God that you created? <laughs> Don't you want a God that you can't understand? Don't you want an eternal God that God teaches you that I am eternal? What does that mean? I've always been and I always will be. What does that mean? I don't know that I can really grasp that. I understand the English language and I understand what God is saying to us. But the fact that He always has been, 
Well, if he began, look, if way back when, wherever it was, if he had a beginning, then he would have had to have had a creator. And then that creator, now you got to explain that one. And if you say, well, somebody created God, well, then who created that guy? Then you take him back and you got the same question over and over and over. No, God's eternal. Do, you, do I understand it? No, I do not. But, I'm, but that is a wonderful truth to me. Why? Because my finite mind doesn't understand something that he does. So when I have troubles and problems and I can't figure them out, I take them to the one that knows everything. They counsel with wood nozzles. They sacrifice to idols in wooded areas. <coughs> Excuse me. In pride, they have left the Lord uh, and went their own way, logically moving in their own way. Faithful, their faithfulness is short-lived. At different times in, in their history, as they, maybe they were on the verge of revival or had a mini-revival that was short-lived and they turned right back to where they were. These are all things that are listed in this book. They have left being merciful, God says, and the knowledge of God. They have forgotten that God remembers everything. And that's a quote. God says, I don't forget every, anything. I remember everything except the things I choose to forget. And he says, all of your wickedness, I remember every part of it. And judgment day is coming. But it doesn't have to be that way, he says. They concern themselves in chapter 7, verse 3, with making, with making the king happy. Not the king, not the capital K, the little K. We can't be so concerned about that, folks. Now, you know, I, I, look, I'm not saying go out. I believe we should, you know, we talked Wednesday night about praying for the people in authority over us. And I believe in that. And it's commanded. It's commanded. But that don't mean that, 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 look, that doesn't mean at all that we should allow them to shut us down. It just doesn't. We shut down for a little while when COVID first came in. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you why we did. We did because I didn't understand it. I was worried about it for you. And that's the truth. I got with the deacons and I said to the deacons, I'm worried, I'm worried for, our, for our senior people especially, really for all of us. We, none of us understand what this thing is. We shut down for a period and then you remember, we started meeting out here. Now we know a lot more about it. I'm not, look, I'm just saying this. When the government starts to tell us to do things that keep us from following our God, then that government has become the king. And we need to be very careful about that. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? I don't really know what that means tonight. I'm just telling you that we need to be very careful. We need to take everything into consideration. We can't just flippantly say, this person said this, this person said that. No, what we need to, what we need to pray about is what is he saying? That's what we need to pray about. They have not responded to the mercy of God, chapter 7. He says, though I have bound and strengthened their arms. And he don't mean bound and, tear, uh, and, and uh, tying them up. He means I've strengthened them, yet do they imagine mischief against me. I feel sorry for God. I feel sorry for him when he had to put up with that. And I feel sorry for him today. I feel sorry for him when I fail him. I mean, it starts at home, right? I feel sorry when I fail Him. I feel sorry when our churches have failed Him. I feel sorry when our nation has failed Him. Then in, ver in chapter 8, he says, God speaks of writing great things to them, but they were counted as strange things. He said, I've written, I've given you Scripture. I've given you my mind and you've looked at it and said, that's, that's weird. That's what, that's what strange means. It means, uh, it means different. It means unauthorized. It means they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't respect the Word of God that God had given to them at that time. They didn't respect it. And they said, they said it's unauthorized. You're telling, look, they're saying exactly what they say today. You know? Excuse me, but it's warm up here. They're saying exactly what they say today. Man wrote that book. That's what they said back then. It's strange. 
filled with a bunch of stuff. How do we know God wrote it? Man wrote the book. Same thing. There's nothing new under the sun. Their excuse for not following the Word of God is, is our excuse today. Well, it's just written by man. Yeah, well, check it out. About 40 authors wrote this book over a 1600 uh, year period of time, and it doesn't ever contradict itself. The odds of that are unimaginable. Unimaginable. The Bible had lost its meaning to them, and it has lost its meaning and power today. When I witness to somebody, I will often say, now you believe this book is the Word of God, right? And I've had people say, no, I don't, I don't believe that. Right away, I'm like, oh boy, we got a problem now. But I still take them through the Scripture. Why? Because the Scripture is powerful. And the Scripture can melt away that unbelief. Still take them. <coughs> Excuse me. Still use the Word of God. But immediately I think, okay, we need to be very careful here. Well, not that you're not careful all the time, but, but here's somebody that, that the Bible has no meaning, for, you know, for whom the Bible has no meaning. God reminds them in chapter 11 that He delivered them and healed them by bringing them out of Israel. And they didn't even know it. They've forgotten it. They haven't passed it down. Mothers and fathers failed to pass down what God had done for them. By the works of their own craftsmen, they fashioned calves. One at Mount Horb, and later they had two situated in Israel. Later they had two golden calves. You think that the golden calf was done after Moses came down from meeting with God and destroyed it? Well, it wasn't. It worked its way back into their religion. There was one in Dan, and there was one in somewhere else. And I don't remember that place, but there was two situated. And, and, and Jeroboam said, you don't need to go down. Look, you don't need to go down to Jerusalem down to the southern kingdom. We're not like them. I'm going to set you up two places you can go to worship and bring your sacrifices and your offerings there. And you know what they were, you know what was there? Golden calves. Came back hundreds of years later. History truly does repeat itself. Now what's the point tonight? I'm going to wrap this up. May we remember the message of Hosea as we worship the Lord. Remember that backsliding, listen, backslidden, I think the word backslidden or backsliding is used 12 times in the Bible. Okay? 12 times, three times in this book. It's kind of a good indication of where, what God is seeing. He said you're backslidden. You've, you, you've turned away. Now you may still be offering your sacrifices, but you brought all these other gods in with it, and I don't, that's not the way I work. We don't work that way. Now here's the good thing. Hosea chapter 3 and verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who, took, who, looked, to one, who looked to other gods and loved flagons of wine. He told, he told uh, Hosea, he said, Go find Gomer. She gave him three children, Jezreel, Laruma, and Loami. And then she left. She left to play the harlot. And God said, this, this is exactly what Israel's done. Then he says, go find her. And he searched for her. And he found her. And she was a slave for somebody. She had, you know, in her ways had dropped her and lowered her status. And, and she was being sold as a slave. And, and, and Hosea comes up and says, there she is. There's Gomer. And he buys her back off of the slave auction block and takes her back home. And that's exactly what God says, I want to do with my people. And God will do that with His nation. There will be a time when they are restored. God wants to reconcile. If you, if somebody watching tonight... If, if you're away from God, God desires to reconcile. And look, you, you may say, but I'm backslidden and I'm horrible and you wouldn't believe the things that I've done to Him. No, 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 I might not. But God, but God says the way back is always there. There is always a way back. There's always. And just as He told Hosea, you go find Gomer and you buy her back. 
That's an illustration to my people that I love them and I want them back and we'll, we, we will be reconciled. And I think that's a great verse. It's kind of like the Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. God says, whatever horrible thing that you've got and whatever horrible thing that you've allowed to get into your life and you've made idols and, and, you, and you've brought other gods in, He says, all you have to do is repent and let's be reconciled. It's a warning. It's a warning to not follow the same path that Israel followed. And, 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 and Hosea's life was a living warning of... Um, of the judgments coming, and it did come, because the people refused to turn and repent of their ways. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the book of Hosea, and we just sort of skimmed the surface of it tonight, bringing out the main message of it, which is that judgment is coming to an adulterous nation to an adulterous nation and judgment's coming. But He called them back for 18 years and they would not. And judgment came. But we know that You have made a way back. And for Your nation, but also for us. If we find ourselves in that same position, may we never think that, well, God hates me. No, God wants you back. God wants us back. He wants to be reconciled. He wants to sit down and say, listen, let's talk about this. This can be right. Lord, if any of our people have found themselves out there as Israel did, before judgment comes and strikes into their life, and it's, really, it's not judgment on sin because that's, been, that's already, it's already happened on the cross. But it is the consequences of our decisions. May we turn from them and start making right decisions that we may enjoy the, the fruitful relationship with you that you desire to have with us. We love you. Thank you for this time together tonight. Help us to be warned by this, to stay on focus and worship the only God that there is, the only true God, and that's the Lord. We thank Him for everything that He's done in our life. Bless us tonight. Bless our church. Watch over our people now. As they uh, travel home, thank you for their faithfulness of being out tonight. Watch over them and give them a great week. May we live for you, Jesus, not like Israel. May we live for you uh, as our God, as our only God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.